Good evening, everybody. And on behalf of the Royal Institute of Philosophy, welcome to the LSE, who are hosting this lecture this evening. Each year, the Royal Institute puts on four distinguished guest lectures in four capital cities around the British Isles, London, Edinburgh, Cardiff, and Dublin. And this, the London Annual City Lecture, as the most long established of the four, is in a way the highlight of the Royal Institute's annual calendar. So it's especially pleasing to be able to introduce this evening's lecturer, Professor Alvin Noe, of the University of California at Berkeley. Among his many distinctions, Alva Noe has been visiting fellow at the Center for Consciousness Studies in Copenhagen and at the Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin. Alva first became known for his work in the philosophy of mind and the philosophy of perception, on which his books include Action in Perception and Out of Our Heads. He championed an inactive approach, which has important implications for neuroscience and has now become part of the philosophical mainstream. More recently, he's branched out. His book on baseball, Infinite Baseball, came out in 2018. And particularly relevant to his concerns this evening, he's been working recently on the philosophy of art. His book, Strange Tools, came out in 2015, Learning to Look in 2021, and his latest book, The Entanglement, How Art and Philosophy Make Us What We Are, is just out. His lecture this evening is entitled, What Does Art Tell Us About Ourselves? Life, Art, and Philosophy. Alva. Thank you. Thank you all very much for being here. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honor for me, and uh, yeah, it's a thrill. Um, in the uh, mid-1930s, the German philosopher Edmund Husserl wrote a book called The Crisis of the European Sciences. I'm sure some of you know it well. Um, he was living in exile in Prague at the time, He'd been discharged from his professorship in Germany a few years earlier for the crime of being Jewish, in effect. The crisis, as the book is known, makes a wild, crazy, audacious claim that the crisis then facing Germany and Europe and indeed the whole world on the eve of the Second World War was a philosophical crisis. And more specifically, it was a crisis to do with the understanding of science and its place in our lives. The problem with science for Husserl was not that it somehow falls short. The problem rather was that empirical science, whether that of Einstein or Schrodinger or Galileo or Newton, was just all too successful. Its methods and its mathematical standards of precision, its determinacies, its certainties, had just come to seem like the only game in town. But science, for Husserl, had less than nothing to say about human experience, about subjectivity, about consciousness, about values. And so precisely science's, um, science's power and success, precisely the fact that science seemed like the only game in town, um, created an environment in which there's a sort of a vacuum for, a de for dealing with questions of value and meaning and experience. The very resources we need to understand ourselves and flourish seem to be forced out by science. Now, we are today, I think, uh, resident in a world very like Husserl's. Paradoxically, this seems truer now than it has at any time since the Second World War. Ours, too, is a world in a state of emergency. And I can't come here to visit you without acknowledging that fact. 
How many crises are there? There are so many. War in Europe, war and terror in the Middle East, the rise of authoritarianism and its model in China, the surge of anti-democratic movements in Europe and the United States, the climate crisis, so this is going to get worse before it gets better, the pandemic, inflation, one might mention the obsession with counting steps, chat GPT, surveillance capitalism, and on and on and on. Wherever I go, and I travel a lot, I encounter the same anxieties about different local concerns, but there seems to be a lot of fear going on. And we know, too, I think, the crisis of science that Husserl had in mind. Natural science, or empirical science, offers a very thin and finally unsatisfactory conception of the human. You can choose from a menu of three. You are a computer. You are a bag of genes. You are a network of neurons. Either way, you're trapped inside your own head. You're a stranger in a strange land. And you're probably not what you think you are. Now, it is not my aim today to argue that the root causes of the problems that the world faces are philosophical. And as much as I'd like to, I'm not going to argue that art and philosophy are in a position to save us. But there is, I have come to believe, no human life without art and philosophy. And not because these are sources of pleasure or comfort or solace, although they sometimes are, but rather because human beings everywhere always are artists and philosophers. This belongs to our makeup. Or more to the point, it is art and philosophy always and everywhere that make us. We make art, we philosophize, and what we produce are not exactly discoveries, not exactly findings. What we produce are new ways of thinking, new ways of feeling, new ways of acting, new ways of being. So that's what I want to talk about tonight. Uh, before I launch into it, many of the ideas that I want to share with you are worked out in this book that Edward kindly mentioned, The Entanglement. Um, I began work on the entanglement during the pandemic in lockdown under the previous presidential administration in the United States while rioters filled the streets where I lived in outrage after the murders of George Floyd and others by police. And I, I started working on this book literally to the right of my desk, where, where my bags packed. Um, and I had a full tank of gas in the car outside as I waited for the potential evacuation order to come down because of the danger of forest fire, because the whole city was ringed by forest fires at that time. So this is the background in which I'm thinking these thoughts. And while I imagine that each of you has a different story, different set of personal circumstances that um, shaped your lives over the last three, four, or five years, I want to acknowledge that however different your personal circumstances may have been, there may be a sense in which it is shared crisis that is our shared background. 
And I, again, sort of in the spirit of, you know, I, I came from California to give this lecture, sort of in the spirit of arriving here with you. Again, I want to acknowledge that. One last comment. I heard a uh, lecture on art by a 95-year-old man the other night. It was given uh, about a week after the 7th of October. And the speaker began by saying that he was worried that maybe it was wrong to come together and talk about art when there's so much madness and killing in the world. But then he added, maybe it's important, even necessary, that we come together and talk about art because there's so much madness and killing in the world. And to that, I say yes. <clears throat> Indeed, moving forward now, it is my main objective tonight in this conversation with you to, to, to try to find ways to say yes to art and the aesthetic and to their place in our lives in a world which, as in Husserl's world, seems in many ways increasingly incapable of appreciating what art and the aesthetic is. This is a quotation from an artist that some of you will have heard of, Robert Filiou. Art is what makes life more interesting than art. And in a way, this beautiful sentence could serve as my watchword or motto, not just for this talk, but for the book and for my, my, my current thinking. It captures, in a way, beautifully, the sort of productive circle formed by art and life. Art is important, but because of the way it lets us better understand our lives and ourselves, and the way it renews and reorganizes and transforms life itself, life becomes something different in an art world. Our world is an art world, and it has always been an art world. Art makes life more interesting than art. Art makes life more interesting than art, sort of suggesting that if not for art, life wouldn't be what it is. It would be different. So um, I thought that I would begin tonight um, by saying something about aesthetic experience. And I thought a useful way to do that to, to, would be to find a way of bringing art into the room with us. So I'd, I'd like to um, begin by discussing a poem by Walt Whitman, which some of you may know I also discussed in Strange Tools a long time ago. This is a poem, so it's a work of art. It is about the experience of a work of art. I hear the trained soprano. She convulses me like the climax of my love grip. The orchestra whirls me wider than Uranus flies. It wrenches unnameable ardors from my breast. It throbs me to gulps of the farthest down horror. It sails me. I dab with bare feet. They are licked by the indolent waves. I am exposed, cut by bitter and poisoned hail, steeped amid honeyed morphine. My windpipe squeezed in the fakes of death. Let up again to feel the puzzle of puzzles and that we call being. Notice right off the bat that this, as I already said, is a poem about art or about the experience of art. And I just want to sit for a moment with the observation that so much of what art does is in response to and dialogue with other art. It's not always art versus life. It's art in the space of, of other art. Um, and I was put in mind of this not that long ago when I visited the... Um, Nasher Sculpture Gallery in Dallas, Texas. And I saw this sculpture by Rodin. And I'd never seen anything by him quite like this. 
But what really impressed me was right next to it was this sculpture by Brancusi. And I had known a story about Brancusi, which is that he was offered a job by Rodin. He was offered a job in Rodin's uh, studio, and he <coughs> turned it down on the grounds that a flower won't bloom in the shade of a big oak tree. He said something, something like that. But I thought that in a way, these, with putting these two images side by side, there is a way in which we can sort of see what Ben Kush was getting at. Because while his sculpture is not about this sculpture, there is a way in which it is. There's a way in which it's commenting on it. Enough drama, you might be saying. Enough anatomy. Enough feeling and indulgence. So if Rodin's piece looks to us as if it's almost classical, and if it plays with time and history in that way, Brancusi's work also plays with and distorts history. It's almost like a cross between a cartoon and something we would dig out of an ancient soil. Another feature, let me go on back to the poem, another feature to which Whitman directs our attention, in fact, there's a way in which he clobbers us over the head with it, is the way in which art can provoke in us ardors of passion that are bodily, physical, almost biological in character, comparable in a very real way to the pleasures of, and pains that we might connect with, with food or hunger or sex and desire. So the climax, the, 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 the feeling of being wrenched and the unnameable ardors, the throbs, the gulps, the horror. But interestingly, Whitman doesn't stop there. He, in a more subtle way, directs us to another feature, which is that not all art is hot the way the experience he's describing here is a hot experience. In fact, I dare say your experience of the poem is not hot. As you read this Whitman poem, you're not experiencing unnameable ardors sort of being wrenched from within you. So sometimes aesthetic experience is hot, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it feels biological, and sometimes it's more literary and more cultural. And in fact, even the experience that Whitman is describing here isn't sort of an animal experience. You know, like, he's not responding to, to sort of animalistic cries. He's responding to a trained soprano and her orchestra. He's responding to an experience that he enjoys very much from within a literary cultural context in which he himself is also, and, and everybody in the room is, is, shares in a range of skills of listening and um, paying close attention. So Whitman, in this beautiful poem, which is part of a much larger work, offers us the thought that in art and in the experience of art, passion and cognition, the ability to read, for example, biology and culture, those, that sensitivity we have to a musical culture, hot and cold, are inextricably entangled. Crucially, if Whitman is right, then art is never just a stimulus to a response, a trigger for an effect. It is something more like an opportunity for the exercise of thought, feeling, emotion, knowledge, curiosity, puzzlement. Indeed, and this is the final Whitman point, he goes so far as to suggest that in the end, when he's finally released from the fakes and throes and gasps of arousal, what does he confront? He confronts philosophy. The puzzle of puzzles, the nature of being. Art in, in Whitman, for all that it is physical and emotional, opens up into, it's a, it's a way into philosophy. Art is 
philosophy. Now, whether or not every experience of an aesthetic kind points in the direction of philosophy in this way, what's striking in Whitman is the way he appreciates that art and its pleasures, arousal, arousals, and frustrations are multiple. If this poem is about experience, then it's a reminder that aesthetic experience isn't one thing. It can be different things. And it's always, as we might say, many things, multimodal. It's a zone for perception, a zone for discrimination, a zone for feeling, a zone for puzzlement. Uh, another remarkable feature of, of aesthetic experience that is not directly put on display by the poem, but I think is in nearby vicinity and that I want to emphasize to you, is that aesthetic experience is not fixed and stable. It is not a final reaction reducible to an I like it or I don't like it. Art mobilizes us. And when it, mobi it mobilizes us when it does, to achieve a response. And that response, too, is changeable and mobile. For example, your experience of this poem itself, this poem that we have read together tonight and some of you maybe had not read before, that experience isn't over and done with. The reading is over and done with. But your experience of the poem is not a timeable event with a beginning, middle, and end like the reading itself. And the poem isn't so much something that triggered a response in you. I like it. It moves me. Or at least that's not all it does. Rather, the poem, or and I, which is just for me now standing in for the work of art, affords you, the reader, a chance to grow, a chance to change, a chance to do something with it and in dialogue with it. You make the aesthetic experience in a way, and this is a John Dewey thought, you therefore make the art itself, where the art is nothing but the experience. Now, this kind of point that, I, that I'm sharing with you and that I'm extracting from the reading of Whitman, these kinds of points tend to be lost on psychologists and neuroscientists. I bet there are a few of you in the room. Um, empirical scientists interested in art usually take for granted that works of art are precisely triggers for an experience. And they think of those experiences as sort of fixed and operationalizable and, and as having a fixed value. And so they ask questions like and seek to perform experiments on such questions as what happens inside of you, in your brain, when you have an aesthetic experience. Or they ask, why do you like this work? Or, why don't you like this work? But what people like, and why they like it, what, what, what a work is, this is not a fixed point. This is the kind of thing that changes through engagement, it changes through caring, it changes through reading and looking and talking, it changes through reflection, through criticism, and it also changes through the historical counterpart of all that, through ch shared practices of reflecting on discussing and evaluating artworks, education. And it's this fixed, open-ended, and genuinely creative character of response that is very much the key to what makes aesthetic experience so valuable to us. And it's also one of the things that gets in the way of successful neuroaesthetics, as it is sometimes called. Scientists studying human vision like to ask, how do we see so much when we're given tiny, distorted, upside-down, jittery retinal images in the eyes? But the question which has gripped me now for many years, I think it's a better question, is not how do we see so much on the basis of so little, but why do we see so little of what there is around us to see? Why is it so difficult to come into perceptual relationship with the world? Now, sometimes we fail to see because, well, we're focused on what we're doing, we're focused on the work, 
we're focused on the business at hand, you're driving or you're running for the bus or you're tying your shoes, there's little call, there's little motivation to look around. But sometimes we fail to see because what there is in front of us defies us. Our habits, the things we think we know, our background understandings let us down. We come up against our own limits when we come up against a certain kind of strangeness. So I think this is what happens when you encounter a language you don't know or, or writing in a script you don't know. The world just doesn't afford you something. But we also encounter this sort of situation in other areas of our lives. For example, I think we can experience this kind of blind or this kind of inability to know that which is there in front of us when we encounter people who are very different from us, people who are sexually or politically or racially or culturally other. In such cases, we are sometimes unable to see. But in contrast with the case of reading and, and speaking, here our limitations are not ethically neutral. And I think this is a reminder that perception is not ethically neutral, it is not value neutral, because it's not about merely detecting or representing the world, it's about coming into relationship with it. And that, that requires a lot more than just retinas. Now the reason I'm giving this, this example now is I want to call this encounter with, I can't see the thing in front of me. I want to call that the aesthetic predicament. And I think of the work of aesthetics, as I understand that word, is the work of moving from not seeing to seeing, or from seeing to seeing differently. It's the work, and I use that, work, that word advisedly, it's, it's the labor, it's the effort to come up against the limits of one's own habits and press on through to the other side. And if you think of the aesthetic that way, it's a very general feature, an abiding feature of our consciousness. It's an abiding feature of our consciousness because our habits sometimes let us down. Perceiving, I use the word seeing, but I mean in any modality. Perceiving and coming into relationship with other people or with situations or with things is hard. And people talk about the challenge to be present. You forgot to mention my book, Edward, Varieties of Presence, which is about the challenge of letting the world show up and, 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 and letting yourself show up in the world. And it's not always easy, which is paradoxical, because you might think, what's easier than showing up? You know, I, didn't, I, just, I just am. No, it's not that easy. So then what does the aesthetic have to do with art? Well, I think... Um, I want to insist that the aesthetic is a general feature of our shared lives together, but that it also is true that art has a very special relation to the aesthetic. Specifically, I think art targets the aesthetic. It works with it and explores it. It makes it a problem. By this, I mean something like artworks in any variety you want, dances, installations, paintings, concerts, Artworks stage occasions for us to make the passage, for us to make the movement from not seeing to seeing, or from seeing to seeing differently. And they typically do something else as well. They afford us an opportunity to catch ourselves in the act of doing that, this thing which we do all the time. They give us an opportunity, artworks provide an opportunity for us to catch ourselves in the act of knowing the world or of coming into relationship with the world. When that means moving beyond one's own limitations, when that means, therefore, changing, reorganizing. So 
If you've ever heard me give a lecture before, or if you've ever read anything I've written, I've written, you've heard this, this next example, because I can't get away from it. I, I come back to it all the time. I, it evolves slightly. Um, and I just gave a talk in New York a few weeks ago with a painter. He was a little annoyed by the example, but, um, but here it goes. This is meant to illustrate what I've just been talking about. You go to a gallery. The pictures that hang on the walls are unfamiliar. You know neither the artist nor the artist's style. Often that sort of experience, not always, but sometimes, and I think if you're honest, I'd be very surprised if there's many people in the, in, the, in the room who don't agree with me, often that kind of encounter can be defeating. The works don't pop, nothing grabs your attention, nothing fascinates, they all kind of look the same. You may find that you are bored. Busy as you are, wrapped up in your life as you are, you may find that you are inclined to keep on moving. On to the next gallery. Or you turn your attention to the people you're with. This state, this state of blankness and disconnection, of being unable to get it, even though it's all there, the state of not knowing or not seeing, is, and this is my point, one of great richness and possibility. And that's true even if it's kind of anxiety-producing, even if it's kind of negative. You know, these days, if you have any friends who work in the museum world, they, have, they are so anxious about making sure everybody has a comfortable, safe experience at the museum. Obviously, they want to be inclusive. They want to be open. They want to sell books in the cafe. They want, they want to make the artwork available. But what if it's the case that a certain discomfort is a prerequisite to the kind of work you need to do on yourself to actually activate the work? You don't, you don't get the work just for the price of admission to the museum. You have to do something once you're in the museum. And it's not just letting your eyes scan across the works. And we've all had that experience of instead of keeping going, you just, you, you look, you look more. You ask a question. Maybe your friend who loves this artist, she's the one who dragged you to the show, she'd start to tell you stuff. She calls your attention to the, the, the use of paint or the color scheme or what was going on historically at the time or, or um, she talks about what she likes in it. And sometimes, if you're lucky, something remarkable happens. The work starts to reveal itself to you. Whereas before, it was kind of flat and indistinct, and they all kind of looked the same. Now, it has its own face. And what was before it was flat, now it has structure, depth, meaning. Now it does fascinate. So it's changed. The work has changed. But how did it didn't? physically change, you changed it. You changed it by turning yourself on, and you opened up the work through that, that work. So the thought that I have, this is sort of a very important idea for me, because I actually think this sheds light on the nature of perception and the nature of art in one, in one neat little example. Works of art give us, give, give us opportunities not just to bring something into focus, which is there, but resistant but it also lets us experience the way we do that. It, as I said before, it lets us catch ourselves in the act of accomplishing that. And something else, um, this is a separate point I haven't mentioned yet, it also lets us cultivate in ourselves the ability to do that. So I do this thing, I have a script, and then I abandon the script, and I lose track of time. Uh, but we're not anywhere near done. <laughs> but Edward, you have the authority to tell me we're done when we need to be done. Um, this is a quote that's very powerful to me from, from Collingwood. At the very beginning of history, we find the extraordinary monuments of Paleolithic art, a standing problem to all theories of truth in human development, and a delicate test of their truth. And of course, he was thinking of works like this. Now, Collingwood wrote those words in 1924, so almost 100 years ago. It's kind of wild to think about that. Um, and his challenge, I think, is clear. If we've been making art since our prehistory, 
then there's a way in which art is not the product of that history, but it's condition, it's precondition. And one of my objectives in this work of mine is to try to take this thought seriously. Art can't come first, if you think in grand evolutionary timescales, how could it? But I want to argue that it arrives at the very beginning. Art is not an add-on, a mere cultural extra. Rather, it's a basic and central part of what makes life and culture possible. Art is not a late addition to the human repertoire. And the work of art, its making and uses, belongs to our basic character as human beings. It's, it's tempting to think, and I, I, as, as Edward mentioned, I began my sort of intellectual career thinking about cognitive science and, and perception as a phenomenon. And it's very tempting to think for somebody with that kind of background that we can sharply distinguish what we do as sort of animals, as it were, at the first order, by nature, from the second order ways that we think about and reflect on and experience our own active lives. To be merely animal, so the thought goes, is to operate effectively at that first level without any participation of the reflective level. What it is to be an animal, then, is somehow understood as having a certain kind of lack in comparison to a person. Concomitantly, the nature of human being is thought to be that which it shares in common with mere animals. But in my investigations, in my work, I want to dwell on the thought that in human being, and I'm open to the possibility that this is true in other animals as well, the two levels are entangled. There is no first order without the second. And the second has a downward influence on the first. That doesn't mean that there isn't a distinction between levels. I think there's an interesting distinction. But it does mean that we have no hope of isolating our true nature in some core that we share with animals and that we could explain in biological terms alone. We are entangled, indeed, we are entangled with, with art and we are entangled with philosophy and we are ourselves a product of that entanglement and so there's a sense even in which we are ourselves products of art. So let me now try to explain the kind of the picture, how this, how this view works. I begin by offering the thought that human life is structured by what I call, and this is just a term I, I, I sort of invented, by what I call organized activity. Organized activity is roughly the domain of habit. And habits are typically skillful. They're often expressive of fantastic forms of intelligence and sensitivity. Habits are also often very basic in our, in our life experience. We, we, we exercise them spontaneously. So the kinds of things that I have in mind when I speak of organized activities are things like talking, walking, breastfeeding as, as an example. I've, I've thought about drawing on treatments of that phenomenon in developmental literature. Another interesting thing about, about organized activities is that they're typically embedded in their goal directed. You know, we walk and talk for reasons. We, we, we breastfeed for reasons. What are the reasons? Those are interesting questions that may not be so self-evident. OK, so, so the idea of organized activity. Two, technology, tools, play a very special role in connection with organized activity. For tools and technologies, depend on being securely integrated into patterns of organized activity. To every tool or technology that corresponds a suite of skills and habits that lets them be there for us. Driving, think of your relation to the car. 
or writing, think of your relation to the pencil or the pen or the paper or the keyboard. Now, dancing, in the sense in which we dance at parties and at weddings and at raves, is in, in one way can be thought of as, in my sense, an organized activity. It's spontaneous, it's natural, it's expressive of intelligence and sensitivity. It typically is social, even if you're in your own sort of rave solitude, you're with other people and that's a big part of what you're doing there. Dancing in trains, what we do and how we move, and it does so with very characteristic temporal dynamics as well as spatial dynamics. So, so dancing is another example of an organized activity. Now, the existence of organized activities, like the existence of tools and technologies, is, I argue, in, in the entanglement, art's precondition in something like the way that straight talk is the precondition of irony. Art doesn't aim at making better tools or better technologies or in organizing us better. It doesn't aim to inculcate more efficient habits. Rather, art works with these constitutive habitual dispositions that are already in place, and artists make art out of them. So to return to the case of dancing, dance artists don't merely dance, and I know we have at least one in the room, uh, don't merely dance the way the rest of us do, at weddings and at parties. Rather, I think, dance artists take the fact of dancing, the fact that we dance at weddings and parties and other places, and put that fact on display. And in putting that fact on display, put us on display, we human beings who are, as a matter of fact, organized in that way. And so, Although that, this may not be the explicit conscious aim of the choreographer, the result is to unveil us to ourselves. Here's another example which I'm very interested in and some of you will be interested in. Pictures and pictoriality in whatever, in whatever medium you care to think of, photography, drawing, painting, digital media. An interesting thing about pictures is that I believe it is a culturally embedded and settled communicative activity. And it has been, as Collingwood noticed, for millennia. We use pictures to show. We are fluent with pictures in personal as well as in commercial transactions. Think of the pictures of the cars advertised by the dealership, or of the chickens and broccoli sent out by the supermarket in the weekly circular that gets put into your mailbox, or of grandma on the mantelpiece, or of the selfies we take together at the ball game, not to mention the superabundance of pictures streaming on social media. These pictures are readily intelligible to us. They don't blind us. They don't stop us. They have implicit or explicit captions that we immediately appreciate. Their meaning, their content, what they show is secured by these captions, so much so that we really very often don't need to think twice to understand a picture. Um, I have a slide I'm, I'm not going to discuss for lack of time in which I show you a very familiar, ordinary, non-distorted um, non photograph, which in some contexts is very hard to understand because its caption has been deprived. Now, art pictures, I think, function differently because art pictures never have a caption, even if they do. The caption is just an occasion for more the need for more sense-making. And precisely because art pictures don't function the way pictures typically function, 
embedded in a communicative activity of buying and selling and showing and communicating, art pictures almost inevitably throw you back on yourself in the sense that they put you, they confront you with the question, what are pictures? What do I normally take for granted when I look at pictures? What is it to look at someone or be seen in a picture? And in a similar way to the way I tried to describe a few moments ago with choreography, pictorial art ends up putting us ourselves on display, unveiling us ourselves. OK, so to summarize the, 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 the argument that I've been giving, art practices are tied to making activities, to human doing, to tool use, to habit. For these latter, these habits and activities, are its precondition. In a way, they're its building blocks. Choreographers make out out of dancing, and maybe other forms of, of non-dance movement as well. I don't mean to prejudge that question. Pictorial artists make art pictures out of picture using cultural practices. Writers of different kinds may make art out of the raw materials given by the basic fact that humans organize themselves linguistically or find themselves organized by speech, by telling, and by writing. But, but crucially, art is tied to the making activities, but art is not itself just another one of the making activities. Artists make things, the dancers choreograph, the painters paint, not in order to surpass mere technology or manufacture, not because they can do it better or in a more aesthetically pleasing way. They make things, finally, because we are beings whose lives are given shape by making, by doing, by habit, by organized activity. By making and by exposing what our making takes for granted, art puts us on display. Art unveils us to ourselves. But that's not all. It does so, I believe, in ways that change us. And finally, even liberate us from the bonds of habit, from the bonds of social and cultural organization. How so? Well, this is where entanglement really comes into focus in my story. Art loops down, to use Ian Hacking's beautiful phrase, art loops down and changes the life of which it started out as the representation. Take the case of choreography. How people dance today at the rave, at the wedding, at the funeral, in cultures where you dance at funerals, is shaped in part by images of what dancing is and what it looks like and what it feels like provided by choreography. Our dancing, mine, yours, incorporates art dancing, however indirectly. And over time, across generations, this entanglement of dancing and the art of dance is affected. The entanglement is not so great as to make it the case that you can't distinguish the two. There's the choreography over there, and there's the kids at a, at, a, at a sixth grade dance over there. But now the relationship between these two things is problematic. And there's a way in which those kids dancing in the cafeteria and their sixth grade school dance are participating in an attenuated way, maybe, but they're participating in an art space. And there's a way in which those great dancers on the stage that you pay a lot of money to see are working with the sort of stuff they did in the cafeteria after school. So what I'm arguing is that technology, using the term now in a broad way, is a modality of organization. It is a ground of habit. Technology is culture, but art, as I'm thinking of it here with you now, is not more technology, it's not more culture, Art refuses culture by disrupting its habitual operations. In this sense, it emancipates us. It's a strong word. In this sense, it emancipates us from culture. It does this by simultaneously unveiling us to ourselves, 
putting the ways we are organized by technologies and habits on display, but by doing so in ways that give us resources to carry on a little bit differently. Art shines forth and loops down and disorganizes us, and thus finally enables the reorganization of the life of which it is the representation and against which it is a reaction. Art is what makes life more interesting than art. And this entanglement of art, excuse me, this entanglement of life with non-life, technology with reflective, disruptive artwork, becomes an essential part of life. It becomes a distinctive feature and dynamic, a, a motor inside of, of our lives. The thing that we need to appreciate and that we somehow fail to do is that these things we do, the talking, the dancing, the breastfeeding, the walking, the driving, and on and on and on, these, these nesting patterns of organized activity can be problems for us. They are ways we find ourselves organized, but in a way without our consent. It's an organization without the consent of the governed. And it's this fact, I think, that explains something like the felt need for art. We are creatures of habit, but we are never only that. We are creatures of habit who always actively resist or at least question our own habits. So I'll, I'll end with a, a final thought. There has never been, so this is, like a, this is a palate cleansing moment, slightly new direction now. There has never been in psychology or in cognitive science any breakthrough comparable to Watson and Crick's discovery of the structure of the DNA molecule. Psychology has done an amazing job collecting facts and data, but it has not established foundational principles. I wrote all my friends, all my professor friends, and verified that statement with them. And the problem is not, I believe, this is, this is my contribution, the problem is not that psychology is young or immature, or that empirical science is only itself just achieving its full adulthood. The problem is deeper than that and more interesting, and I think it's the problem that Husserl understood. It's because, as I would say, human beings are like artworks themselves for human beings. They, or we, are an aesthetic phenomenon. We are not in any sense that we can take for granted just a given. Humans are creatures of entanglement. When it comes to perception, consciousness, love, sex, memory, the body, there are no fixed points, no settled places from which we can begin or move forward. Another way of putting the problem is like this. In the would-be sciences of the human, we never quite know how to stabilize the subject matter. The problem is not with science, which is in good order just as it is. The problem, rather, is that we have not yet come to grips, I think, with the dynamic entangled nature of ourselves. Our lives are shaped and reshaped by art and the aesthetic in the way I've been explaining. The aesthetic is as basic and as original as the fact of consciousness itself, as I've tried to explain. The aesthetic is a live possibility and also an opportunity and a problem and potentially a source of anxiety wherever we find ourselves. We are not fixed, stable, defined, and known. We are changed and reorganized by the very act of trying to bring ourselves into focus. So the, the single thought that I want to end with is that I don't think that there can be a serious engagement with the human, whether in natural science or cognitive science or whatever, that tries to sidestep this awesome and potentially liberating fact that we are ourselves aesthetic phenomena 
who are always in the midst of becoming. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, thank you for that. I think there's a lot I agree with there. Um, I had a, a question about how you might want to accommodate the broader aesthetic experience, um, including the aesthetic experience of nature itself. And I just have a quick example of why I would want to motivate that. So I really like this idea of disrupting our habits, our nested organized activity, and how technology plays into that. And the other day I was walking through Kew Gardens with my six-year-old, and um, we were told we had to leave for the Lights Festival, which I find really annoying we just like to wander in nature. So my daughter said, let's go under that tree there and hide, and we did, and there was a bird. And this was a life-changing experience for my daughter. She was just kind of in this sort of engagement with a bird, and she went home and she said, I can't stop thinking about this. And it strikes me that that's a transformative kind of aesthetic experience she had that was very sort of tied to nature and biology, and it seems to play a lot of the roles that you kind of are attributing to art with human nature. So I just wanted to see what you thought of that broader aesthetic with nature. Right, thank you. That's a really good, that's a really good comment. I, th I think I really welcome the comment. I, I think that, that um, I'm sort of picking out the aesthetic, and maybe this says something about my personality, and picking it out a little bit by way of a challenge or a difficulty, a kind of um, a feeling that you're not getting it or, or not seeing something, um, which then provides the occasion for reorganizing yourself so that you do get it. Um, and and if, you, if you call that the aesthetic, if that negative component is part of it, then what you're describing maybe falls a little bit outside of, of that, or maybe not. But I, I want to be clear that I think there's lots of other learning activities that might be richly valuable and, and reorganizational. Um, I'm not sure whether they all need to be treated as, as, as a species of the aesthetic. Um, people do talk about the, the, the experience of nature and, and, and uh, the awe in, in, when confronted with it, which is, which is very much, I think, what I'm talking about, when you can't really get your mind around what you're confronted by. And maybe that's what was going on with your daughter and her interspecies encounter, um, which would then more make it fit my, my aesthetic language better. And again, crucially, art is only one of the many ways that there are for investigating the aesthetic. Thank you. Thanks for a uh, engaging, eloquent, and erudite talk. Uh, sometimes you see another person doing something and uh, you realize they're engaging in a habit that you've engaged in before. And uh, that kind of leads you to a certain other realization about how you might want to, how you feel about that uh, habit and how you want to change your behavior as a result of that uh, realization. Would you say that's a, um, a form of that, witnessing that person carrying out that habit as a form of art? And if it is, does that mean that art is a vehicle for self-improvement or for uh, personal perfection? And is there art that isn't such a vehicle? Is there art that isn't transformative? Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, I, so, it's, I've, I've been suggesting that art is an opportunity for growth and change. But I, I, I want to avoid suggesting that everything which is an opportunity for growth and change is therefore art. Um, I'm interested in a specific kind of growth and change made possible when you come up against your, when you come up against the limits of your ethos, when you come up against the limits of what you know how to do and are forced to, as in my gallery example, forced to try to bring into focus what is there. Um, one interesting feature, I didn't, I didn't say this, but it was implied, I think, in some of the things I did say. One interesting fact about art is there is no sense in which one can um, say, ah, 
this is the right way to understand it, or this is the right way to do it, or this is the right lesson to learn from it. Um, precisely because I see art as creating these opportunities for, for, for not knowing how to go forward and for throwing you back on your own resources, um, you're always going to be in a, in a state of, of experimentation and sort of non-goal-directed uh, change. Uh, so for that reason, I'm, I'm reluctant to connect art as aiming at something like self-perfection or, or, um, or self-improvement, I think you said. I don't, I don't, don't quite like that idea. Um, you know, if I, if I hire you to be my personal trainer, then I have a very clear sense of, okay, here's my goals, here's what I'm paying you, here's how I can measure whether this is a success. I want to be a lot stronger and a lot thinner when we're done, something like that. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't want to have, have broken the bank. So uh, there we know coming into it what success means. But we never know coming into it with art what success means. Hi, thank you for such a thought-provoking lecture. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts are. Um, say, what would the world be like without the existence of art? <laughs> Thank you. Right. Um, well, there wouldn't be any humans in it. So it's not compatible with life? No, it is not. Oh. I say that, so when I say art, I don't necessarily mean the stuff you can buy at Sotheby's or see in the gallery. Art can have a much more improvisational coming into to being, in my sense. That's why I often talk about art and philosophy. I think philosophy does the same thing as art does, in my sense, but it uses different means. Art is, uh, philosophers conjure up thought problems that you simply can't deduce an answer to based on what you already know. You need to reorganize yourselves to make sense of a way forward. And so philosophy changes us without teaching us the truth. In the relevant sense, there never is a truth. Um, and similarly, I think wherever there were people, as far back as you go in, your, in our fantasized history or prehistory of ourselves, you'll find people that come up with the puzzle of puzzles and that we call being. Um, and, and so there's, there's always art and there's always philosophy, I think wherever there's culture. I think you're smuggling in an elitist institutional theory of art because in the examples you choose uh, to accept and reject, which are not explained by your theory. So if you take your theory seriously, that art is the reorganization of organized activity, of habits and, then, and, cu uh, and culture, then science and mathematics and Temple Grandin's invention of abattoirs for cows and Freud's theory and Newton and Euler and AlphaGo uh, are all doing art, um, but you reject those. And if GPT-15 develops an understanding of um, your experience and then works out some way of explaining that to you, that's art as well. So I think what worries me about um, this is that you're smuggling in an elitist institutional theory um, th in the back door. Hmm. Um. I'm not a smuggler. I don't want everything to be art. I don't want all science. I want to differentiate science from technology and art from design. And I want to make these distinctions. Um, I'm going to leave the question of its elitism aside for a moment. Um, I think there's a, all the examples that you just gave, the Temple Grandin case, AlphaGo, uh, science and technology, all have one very striking difference, I think, uh, from the cases that I want to call the art cases. And that is that they are the solution to an antecedent problem. They, they are the solution to a problem that can be articulated and understood antecedently. And it's possible to talk about criteria of success in advance. So for example, either AlphaGo plays chess well or Go well or doesn't play Go well. And so, so that, that's just the difference. When I, when I make a painting or when I sing a song or dance a dance, there just isn't any pre-existent standard by which to say, is it valuable or is it not? 
the question of its value is something that we need to try to work out together. Now, you are right that in our culture, sometimes people dodge the value question and say it has value because it's in a museum or because it's in an elitist institution. But I don't, I don't want to make that move. I think the fact that art is in a museum doesn't mean it has any distinct or artistic value. And I think the fact that it's made by people who are vocationally artists, earning money as artists, isn't what makes it art except in an anthropological sense, which I don't think is the interesting one. But the science example, it, there's no predefined goal. There, it's an unsupervised learning problem just to explain the data. So, I don't, and the aesthetic function is what uh, model explains oh. the data more uh, effectively. We have a big disagreement because I don't, I don't think that AlphaGo is an agent. I was assuming you were talking about the engineers designing AlphaGo. AlphaGo, I, AlphaGo is not an agent. AlphaGo is a no, it's is, a strange is, is tool. A toy. It's, it's a, a toy. strange tool. No, it's it's a machine. It's a machine. It's a toy. It's not. There's nothing strange about it. It's like language. No, it's, but there's nothing strange about AlphaGo. AlphaGo is is everything about it is understood, except except we set up the process. Is language a strange tool? I think we've got so many questions. We could, Lang could go but, but, on and on, but it's unfair to language always. I mean, it's, let me just say this because it's very okay. important. The way some linguists think about language, it is um, just a, a formal system where you have well-formed formulas or you don't. But what's interesting about our language is that we're making meaning right now with each other as we try to understand each other. And I don't think that's something that, um, that um, so, so I think that there is art in language, but that has nothing to do with AlphaGo. But I'll talk to you afterwards about it, gladly. Thank you so much for your lecture. Um, so at the beginning of your lecture, you spoke about we are in a very kind of tumultuous and traumatic period of sort of human history. So my question was, do you believe that these periods of human history where there is so much sort of kind of collective trauma going on, does that produce far more transformative pieces of art at that time? Or are these periods sort of harmful to the quality of, oh, not quality is the wrong word, but quality to the, trans, uh, harmful to the transformative nature of the art we kind of produce at that moment. Do we kind of turn our attention away from art and start kind of um, just sort of repeating the sort of patterns that technology kind of gives us? And yeah, do we take our eye away off the ball in a sense mm. and stop kind mm. of moving forward is the wrong word, but yeah. evolving yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, the, is the word. That's a beautiful question. And <laughs> I, actually, I'm afraid to try to answer it. It's, it's, it goes a little bit beyond what I, what I feel I know. Um, again, when we use the word art, sometimes we're thinking about, you know, London theaters and the National Gallery and the concerts and the clubs, and, and we're thinking of things that require well-being. They, they require safety, right? Um, in a war zone, those things suffer. But if you think of art in this deeper sense that I'm trying to get at, where it's possible for you and I to have an interaction, which is, if you like, the moral equivalent of art, like I show you something you don't understand and then you change yourself to understand it, that, I think, happens wherever there are human beings and you can't stop it, except, except by ending life. Um, I want to come back a bit um, to a similar question that the girl over there asked. Um, the society without art um, or the person without art kind of, as I understood, wouldn't be able to exist. And let's say the society of Dawkins's. Society, uh, so society of Dawkins's, let's say, who, uh, you know, count the genes and the human as a... Oh, Dawkins, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, the scientists, let's say they're pure scientists. Yeah. And since they exist, therefore, uh, art must be in the scientific society. So what is art in the scientific society? Great question. So again, we have at our disposal a kind of conventional picture where we say the scientist is the scientist and the philosopher is a philosopher and they, they teach in different buildings at the university and they have nothing to do with each other and, and the artist works over there in the studio. But on my view, most of the best scientists are sometimes philosophers and most of the best um, philosophers are engaging the empirical world in a, in a scientific way. So 
I think there's a difference between a scientific question and a philosophical question, or a scientific question and an aesthetic or artistic question. And that's a real, and that's as hard as a difference can be. But it doesn't align to our jobs. And that's something we, you know, so, so um, many good scientific discoveries involve the kind of conceptual creativity that goes with philosophy. Does that, does that, do you see how that's an answer to your question? Um, it, I, I could discuss more and more about that. Um, it partially does, yes, but I wonder also about the possibility of even existence of a society which doesn't have any art, um, whether it's even possible. Yeah, so there are definitely, in, in, in the diverse history of humankind, there are different kinds of societies with different sorts of material cultures and different degrees of, of um, just as there are different, some societies have mathematics developed in universities and some societies don't. Equally good mathematicians in both places, but you, know, you go to some countries for the university. Um, so there's those kinds of anthropological differences, but I think that the fundamental need for art is more basic than that, and it has to do with um, the attempt to, in a shared way, negotiate the aesthetic predicament, uh, which is not being able to see where you are or see the situation you're in. Art just works on it more. I feel like card-carrying professional artists just thematize it more explicitly. But it happens all the time. And I think, I think it probably happens. This is, this is, this is going to take us farther afield, and I don't know how. I have to think of some good examples to convince you of this. But I think there can be art making practices that don't involve producing objects. Um, so there can, I mean, we see this that today. You know, we, I, we just saw Marina Abramovich recently. You know, not everything that she did involved the creation of an object. Uh, and that was no obstacle to its being art. <laughs> I think you have answered my question where you were saying that art, the best of the philosophers were mathematicians, especially in the old eras as uh, in the Greek era or ancient Egyptians. Why in the modern world we no longer have this the art and the science combined to one another entangled? Like quantum physics to me is art, especially when I delve deep in their studies, the electromagnetic field like always reacts to the way we look um, right. at it. It has no way, right? So why right. we no, lo, no longer have this? Right, great, great question. Um, the short answer is I think we do. I think we do. It, you have to look in different departments. Because of the cultural life of scientific institutions, there are things a little bit more rigid so that the very same people are not um, writing philosophy texts typically and also doing fundamental work in, in physics, which that used to be the case. But um, in, in the cognitive sciences, for example, or in the social sciences, it is very often the case that the people who are trying to create serious empirical work are forced, of needs be, to think about the fundamental conceptual issues. So you have to look in different areas, different neighborhoods of learning, to find that kind of people wearing different hats. Yeah. Thank you very much for the talk. It was fascinating. Um, so, my, to get into my question, um, so you said a number of times that the function of art or what art does is challenge us, I think you might say, um, or yeah. confront us with a problem, something we don't understand, yeah. Yeah. and it forces us to grow or to change. Yeah. And I'm just, and I think this sits with the way we talk about great pieces of art as being deep or inexhaustible in that there's, there's always more to learn about them yeah. and they can always show us more about ourselves. But then that got me thinking about um, sometimes when, we, when there's a great piece of art, it's its simplicity that speaks to us. Yeah. Think about a really simple melody, and it's not complicated harmonically, yeah. you can understand it. Um, it's not like, in some sense, it doesn't feel like I'm learning more about it, yeah. or about may maybe I am learning about myself, but yeah. the simplicity is what speaks to us. In, what, in that case, how, how would you explain that, that sort of case? Do you have an example in mind? I don't know. Um, are you like thinking of a pop song? Is that what you mean? Or what do you, what do you have in mind? I don't know. Somewhere Over the Rainbow, that melody that oh, yeah, can okay. just kind of sit on okay. its own without. Yeah, OK. Um, 
See, one of the problems is, and this is why sometimes when I get into conversations with artists, it, it can be, there can be a little frustration, because I'm speaking very general terms, and we really, for any specific phenomenon, we need to start really paying close attention. Um, I think just because something is a song doesn't mean the art is happening in the space of music. And that's a very kind of strange thing to say. But like, I think a lot of the best pop music is, um, is performance art that's, that's working, using music to experiment with ideas that are not themselves necessarily just musical. So if you think of, if you think of the classical pianist is a vehicle for the musical idea, I think often in pop music, the musician is a vehicle for another kind of art. The, the music that the, that, the, that the musician is making is a vehicle for other kinds of constructions of self and style ideas that are very important, very artistically astonishing. But, but you're looking at the wrong thing if you look at the music. But you think, oh, this isn't a very complicated syncopation. This isn't a very complicated melody. This can't be good. But then when you go to a rock concert, you don't sit there quietly studying the syncopation and the melody. In fact, you shout, you dance. So how, how is that? It's, it's not a listening activity in the same way. Something else is going on. And I think there's always going to be interesting stories about what else is going on. So sometimes simplicity is not... Um, well, look at my example of Brancouche and Rodin. Who's, who's the better sculptor? Well, there's a certain way. You might want to say, well, look at Rodin. Look at that body. Look at how he, how he created this figure. And you know, the, the, the Brancouche is, is clumsy and, and, and un, undeveloped in a certain way. But it's artistically radical and great. So we just need to look very, very close to figure out where the art in the art is. Hi, Alba. Um, thank you for the talk. I, I wanted to ask you about the future. Yes. Um, and I wanted to ask you about the future as it pertains to your theory, and specifically as we might understand it through globalization. And one of the claims that's often made about globalization, which is that the the world is homogenizing. There are fewer languages now, for instance, um, than there used to be, which might suggest um, that there are fewer opportunities to reorganize ourselves because there are fewer habits that maybe exist in the world. So um, if this is the case, what does this mean? What does it entail for your theory? Does it mean that art is somehow becoming more important, um, less important? Um, I thought it seems like it was an interesting question to ask because, well, you began with the crisis and this kind of mm -hmm. world historical moment, mm -hmm. which we seem to be living through again. Mm. Uh, so it kind of raised some questions to me about the future. Mm. That's a question I'd like to sit with and think more about. Um, because I have limited time and there's other, other hands, I'll just say that I'm inclined, I think, not to accept the premise that um, there's, there's a loss of diversity or a loss of homogenization. I mean, it depends on how you count it. There is, with the destruction of civilizations, there's this loss of language. But the question of what a language really is, what a subculture really is, is, uh, um, is, an, interesting, is an interesting one. I, I, uh, I had a drink last night with a 24-year-old man whose every way of talking and inhabiting the world is different from mine, but really different from mine. We both spoke English, kind of, but it was a real interesting experience for me to connect to him, full of admiration and only positive feelings, but it was, he's part of the endless stream of diversification which, which, uh, which happens inevitably. And you know, we talked about AlphaGo, I mean, reinforcement learning, that whole, that's a whole little invention of a language that is a, a whole little, little culture of people. But I'm very interested in this question of, of how we differentiate ourselves um, one of my favorite programs is um, the Great British Baking Show. Have you ever heard of that? We, we, we watch it on Netflix back home. And um, they, 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 they must very carefully choose people from different regions of the country in order to highlight linguistic diversity of, of Britain. 
So all these different accents there, I just sit there. For me, it's an opportunity to like just think about, oh my God, like people talk that way. That's so cool. And uh, that's not going away. That's not going away. All right, thank you for the amazing talk. Um, um, I'm really grateful that my friend Casper, he brought me here. Oh, so, um, so my question would be, I, I was really interested in your idea about how um, science be be becomes this paradigm for assessing success. And then I remembered some, something Fairbairn has similar idea that not all about science that can gauge success, but also other things can. And I think you propose this really amazing um, articulation which is around aesthetic and, and, and art. And it's not about aesthetic being a part of art, but rather art pointing at something. And this, uh, this whole transaction of disruption really, really, I think it's really powerful uh, argument that, that's been displayed today. So, so I wonder, for, for, this, uh, for this organized activity, mm -hmm. what you call it, um, or habit, um, is it dormant? Is it latent? Is this something that requires certain agencies or let's say um, rituals in certain ways? Is it, is it a kind of um, new rhetoric but old tradition? So, so I wonder how, how is that unraveled with, with this whole um, scenario of your talk? Thank you. Hmm. I'm not sure I completely understand the question. Um, the, um, one of the, the I'm going to say something, and I think it's in the neighborhood of your question, yeah. and I hope it will be, be helpful. Um, I'm, I think it's a very hard question to think about agency in this kind of story that I'm talking about. Um, because I, I tell these stories about what people are doing and they're looking at the art and they're doing this and they're going to the playing with the birds or they're doing what they're doing. And it sounds like I'm attributing, or the artists are doing this, it sounds like I'm attributing all this intention to them as if it's all deliberate. So as if I go to the museum with my friend and try to sort of make myself new in the face of the, uh, the painting. And that seems crazy. That just gets it wrong. Similarly, when I look out at you right now, it seems crazy to say in a certain way that I'm actively trying to come into a relationship with you in seeing you. Mm. That just seems to be the wrong register mm. for the relationship between the passive and the active and the implicit and the explicit and the tacit. So I don't, and I, actually I just want to, want to say I don't think I yet have the best language mm. to describe it. It doesn't make me think what I'm saying isn't true. It just makes me think, I've got to figure out better ways of, of trying to get at it. So, um, like when you dance, there's this wonderful phenomenon of sometimes, of sometimes feeling like, actually in other languages you can say, you can use the passive to say, like I am danced, or uh, there is dancing going on. Like it's happening to me. I am danced. And that's interesting. So there, you might literally just be, you start, you, know, you start tapping the floor, you start getting into it, and before you know it, you're in this other state of activity. And the fact that it's not deliberate or aimed at doesn't mean that you're not drawing on background knowledge and skills. It doesn't mean you're not paying attention. It doesn't mean you're not doing anything. So, so I just want to plead a little bit, like you're putting your finger on a problem which is an interesting one. Uh, my question was quite specific. Um, I think you've managed to put art and like good examples and good context. But Can you talk a little louder, please? I was gonna say, I think the way you've spoken about art has been put into context, but philosophy, I don't think yeah. has been, and you've yeah. kind of spoken about it very broadly. Yeah. I was wondering if you could spend a couple of minutes just to tell me what you mean by philosophy. Yeah. And perhaps give me an example. Yeah, very good. And fair, fair point, actually. I kind of made a decision to focus on art rather than philosophy in the presentation. Um, that example I gave of you, where you go to the gallery and you don't find anything too interesting and then you engage and then all of a sudden uh, a landscape of artwork shows up for you. To me, that's almost a perfect analogy for what happens in philosophy. In philosophy, we... We ask questions 
Um, we have arguments, but we never come to settled conclusions. And yet, we're, we're different at the end than we were at the beginning. So the classic example of that, and in the true sense of the word classical, the classic example of that is the Socratic dialogues of Plato. You asked for an example. So the characteristic feature of these dialogues is that somebody thinks they know, they're interrogated, they're refuted, they realize they don't know, and then it's over. And you might say to yourself, what's the value of that? What's so valuable about being refuted? But what I think is really going on there is that Socrates, people like to say that Socrates did philosophy in conversational form, but what's really interesting to me, reading, reading Plato's Socrates, is that he was the enemy of conversation. He, he shut down conversation. Instead of letting you talk, he made you stop, define your terms, carefully reflect on your presuppositions, interrogate your habits, to use my word, interrogate what you think you know, your habitual organization, and disrupt it. And so what you're left with is disruption. But now that's a productive state of being. For the same reason it's productive to be talking about those paintings hanging on the wall. The, 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 you see, what you see is, is different. And so I think that a philosophical text, and I think it's true of Socrates, I think it's true of Kant, I think it's true of Hegel, and I think it's true of me, not to put myself in that category, but, but I mean, just, just it's true what I'm trying to do. The, the philosophical text is not a lesson, but it's an, it's an opportunity for you to participate in the practice of reorganization. And that's why when you read, when you study, are you a philosophy student? That's why when you study philosophy, you don't just memorize the official opinions. You know, Kant thinks that space and time are forms of intuition. I, you know, Wittgenstein thinks that they're a language. No, those words don't mean anything. The bottom line of the text doesn't mean anything. The text itself is like a dojo of ideas for you to work in. Or an even better, I talk about this actually in the entanglement, an even better idea is I think a philosophical text is itself, get this, a score that you can use to think with or play, play with. And so a good philosopher is a philosopher who persuades other people to to take their score into their philosophical studio and, and make philosophy with it, which doesn't mean you agree with it. It means find it a good place to play. Um, so I have, I have a lot more to say about that. But the, the final thing is, I have to stop, the final thing is that um, really this question about why is philosophy valuable if it doesn't produce positive knowledge. This goes back to Husserl's concern. If it doesn't produce positive knowledge in the way that physics does or, or engineering does. And why are artworks valuable if they don't solve world hunger? Right? Not everything is aiming at a function. Some of the work is, 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 is more existential. It's more reorganizational. So in Strange Tools, I said that art and philosophy are species of a common genus, which is reorganizational practice. What a good place to stop. Um, not so good for the people who had questions we didn't get time to air. I'm sorry about that. But thank you to all of you for your engagement and your participation. And thanks in particular, Alba, to you for your lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.